Well, how many of you guys have seen the movie called Overboard? It was made, I think, in 1987, and um, it, uh, it, it has Goldie Hawn and I think Kurt Russell, I think those are the actors. Goldie Hawn plays a, a, a lady by the name of Joanna, and uh, Kurt Russell, his name is Dean. I did a little research, I forgot it's been some time. I, I don't necessarily recommend the movie, I can't remember all that's in it, so I don't want to say go ahead and see it, and then there'll be some things that aren't appropriate. But, but, but the premise of the movie, the basis of the movie is this. Uh, Goldie Hawn's character, Joanna, is a rich lady, and she, uh, she has uh, uh, everything that a, a lady could want, and she has a yacht, and she's on this yacht, and Kurt Russell comes in as a carpenter and, and builds her, uh, you know, a closet, this elaborate closet. They have a little bit of an altercation, and, and uh, she, uh, she says it's not up to hit her standards, and Kurt Russell disagrees, and she ends up, you know, kicking him off the boat, and I think he gets thrown in the water with his tools and everything. And it's comical, and, and, but after that happens, what happens is she, um, you know, is out on the dock, uh, the deck, and, and she, she leans over to grab a ring or something, I can't really remember, and she falls overboard, hence the title, right? She falls overboard, and, you know, the Coast Guard picks her up, and her husband comes, and she's such a pill and such a, such a mean lady, he's like, I don't know who this lady is, she's not my wife, he takes the opportunity to bolt, and he does. And, uh, and Kurt Russell sees it on the news that this lady, you know, has been uh, overboard. And, and, and basically what happens is she develops amnesia. She can't remember who she is. She can't remember any of these things about who she was, what she had, and all those things. And, and I thought, you know, this is a perfect illustration for what we're studying in the book of Ephesians. Because so many times we have amnesia when it comes to knowing who we are in Jesus Christ. We forget what we have. We forget that we're rich in Christ. We forget that we're blessed. Remember last week we talked about that we were, we were blessed. We were saints in Jesus Christ. And, and we went through some of those spiritual blessings, blessings like the inheritance of God and, and the Spirit of God and all these things. And so this morning I want to continue in the book of Ephesians. If you'll turn there with me, Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 23. And Paul continues to remind you and he continues to remind, to remind me of who we are in Jesus Christ. The title of this series that we're doing is, Who Do You Think You Are? And so we're going to continue to answer that this morning. Paul again is speaking in this passage under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And he's speaking to both Ephesian believers as well as to you and to me this morning. With that in mind, and as you find your place there in Ephesians chapter 1, let's go to the Lord and pray in prayer and ask Him to bless us this message. Father, I pray that you would speak mightily through your word. Lord, I pray that hearts would be changed, that we would leave this place, uh, not only have listening to the word, Lord, but being doers of the word. Help us to change by the Spirit's power. Speak to us now, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, Paul says a few things, a few reasons that he is thankful, and he says, for this reason, And I want to stop right there, and a question should come into your mind. For what reason, Paul? Well, because of everything in verses 1 through 14 that we talked about last week, because of who you are in Christ, because you're a saint, because you're blessed, Paul says, I don't cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And he says, it's because of having also heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. But what is Paul saying in this opening passage? He's saying, you are appreciated. He's telling the Ephesian believers, he's telling the believers at Ephesus, he's telling the believers in Asia Minor, he's telling, the Lord is telling you today, you are appreciated. Now now that might bristle a little bit, that that might make you kind of feel uncomfortable, but you know you are appreciated by the Lord. God appreciates the work that you do. And you might say, well, you know, I don't really feel appreciated. Maybe you're frustrated when no one says thank you for a job well done. Maybe you're tired of feeling overworked and underappreciated. Maybe you're getting more criticism than encouragement. Maybe that's grinding you down. Perhaps you wonder all the time if, if it's worth the energy and, and, and the effort and, and the time put in, whether it be in work or church or life in general. Maybe you find yourself wondering if anybody really cares or really appreciates you. We've all been there, right? Feeling underappreciated. 
Well, there's good news. God sees everything you do. God knows the sacrifices you make. He knows the ways you're growing, the people you serve, the times you're generous, the impact you make. And God is appreciative. It's okay to know that he's, he's thankful for your work in the ministry. He knows ultimately it will bring blessing to you. And, and so that's a benefit to you. But he's appreciative of what you do. And I also want to let you know your leaders here at Cornerstone are appreciative. We're thankful for you. Look at verses 15 and 16 of Ephesians and read it this way. For this reason, I, Pastor Dave, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, Cornerstone, and your love for the other Cornerstone saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. You know, your leaders pray for you. We're thankful for you. And if you've never heard it from my lips here today, thank you for serving. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you for just the commitment that you give to Cornerstone. So many people are not faithful to any church. And I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for you, Cornerstone members. I hope you know that, and I hope you believe that. He continues in the phrase at at the end of verse 16, says, while making mention of you in my prayers... And this brings us to the next thing I want us to to notice, and that's you are not only appreciated, but you are prayed for. You are prayed for. You see, Paul was praying for the Ephesian believers as well as those in Asia Minor, right? We know that. And I believe in a general sense, he was was also praying for believers everywhere. Maybe not in this particular instance, but we know Paul had a a heart for, for the loss as well as believers everywhere. And so we know that Paul probably prayed for us, and, and we also know that Jesus prayed for us. You think about that for a moment. The Son of God has prayed for you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus has prayed for you. You say, where do you find that, Dave? Well, John 17, 20 says, my prayer, Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. Speaking of the disciples, he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Listen, don't don't let this be lost on you. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has prayed for you as a believer. Can I get an amen? Jesus has prayed for you. What an amazing thought. And and not only that, and to take a step down, actually, your pastors pray for you. I pray for you. Mike prays for you. If you go to another church, I hope and I think that probably more than likely that pastor prays for you. They pray for for certain things, and in a moment we'll see exactly what we pray for. But, you know, I couldn't help but prepare for this message and know (laughs) that God was calling me to pray for you specifically this week. And in a moment, we'll see what what Paul says and how he prays for these Ephesians. But I want you to know that we pray for you like Paul prayed for you. This week, I I took out our old Rolodex. I went, I I said, I'm not going to do the technology thing this week. I'm not getting on the computer and looking through cbchurch.net and finding all the people. I'm going to take our old Rolodex because it has people in there that maybe have gone and passed on or that has people that maybe we don't know anymore that's just kind of been left in there. And we have to sort through that from time to time. But I said, I'm going to pray for every single person. And I had Diane earlier give me a list of every single person that's a member in our church, every single person that's visited our church. And I went through and I prayed for every single person in that Rolodex. And I can honestly say, I don't see a single person in here that I have not prayed for this week. And I don't say that to boast of myself. I want you to know that people are praying for you and that that should be an encouragement to you, that, that, that God is at work in your life through your leaders, through your pastors, And that we are to to have that same attitude to pray for others. But Paul prays for four things that we're going to look at today. He prays for for four things that you and I would know in in these following verses. He prays for four things. He prays, first of all, that the believers and that you and I would know God better. If you're taking notes, this is number one. He prayed that you and I and believers there in Ephesus and believers everywhere would know God better. Look at verse number 17. He says... At the, at the end of verse 16, let me back up for a second. He says, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. You see, Paul prayed that you would understand more about God, that you would know God better. You know, it's not God's intention that you only know him a little bit you believe that? God doesn't want you just to know him enough for salvation. He wants you to know him more than that. It's this paradoxical thought that I am always satisfied in knowing God, yet I am always wanting to know more of him. 
You ever felt that way? You're at peace and you're satisfied with how, with how much you know God and, and you rest in that thought and you have a relationship with God because of your belief in Jesus Christ and you have trusted in Jesus Christ. You're, you're satisfied with that, but there should be a hunger and a desire and a passion within you as a believer to know God more, to understand Him better. And Paul prays for these people and he prays that they would know God deeper and more. I think about Nikki and I and we have an anniversary coming up. It'll be five years. It seems like just yesterday, right? And at the same sense, it seems like 50 years. You know, let's just be real, all right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like that. But we've been together for almost five years, been married almost five years. And the thing that I, that I love about Nikki is she always sends me texts that say, you know, I just miss you today. I just want to be with you. I just want to, I just want to hang out some more. I want more time. And I can tell that she wants to know me more. She knows me and she's satisfied with me just being me and she's happy and she's in love and I'm in love with her. But, but, but there's this awesome ability that she has to, to want and make, it, make this known. She wants to know me more. She wants to get to know me better. You know, sometimes as a guy, you're like, whoa, you know, but she wants to know me more and more and more. And that's how a love relationship is. And it shouldn't be any different with our relationship with God, should it? In fact, it should be more. We should desire to know God more and more and more. And Paul prays for these people. And I prayed for every single person in here this week that you and I would know God more. Now, there's a key phrase in here. If we look at verse 17 again, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Why is that important? Because only God can give it. You want to know God more? You want, it's this phrase, I want to want to know God more. I want to want to know God more. I, I want to have that desire. I want to have that passion. You know, we're human and sometimes we get lazy and sometimes we just don't care that much about spiritual things. But, but the Bible says that Paul prayed for these people and I, I want to know that I, I want you to know that I prayed for you this week that you and I would want to know God more, that God would give us a spirit. And that's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about an attitude an attitude of, uh, of wisdom and revelation, that we would desire to know God more, that we would desire to have an attitude of wisdom and revelation in knowing God more and more. I hope you have that desire. You see, so many people think of this book like a hammer. And they take it out, and when the world doesn't act like a Christian should act, and it's, mind you, it's the world, they're acting like they should act. And we... That's not right. That's not what God says. And we thump them over head, thump them over the head, thump them over the head. All the while, they're not believers in the first place. So it's like the Bible says, casting pearls before swine. And they're not going to get it unless their spirit is regenerated. But sometimes we do it to other Christians too, don't we? Do this, do this, do this. And we use the Bible as a hammer. And sometimes we do this, <laughs> right? Ah, that last one hurt a little bit. Um, we use it as a hammer. In reality, it is a tool in that sense, and it is used for correction from time to time. But you know, the Bible is also a love letter. God wants you to know Him more, and the way you get to know Him more is through His letter to you. And so our, our gauge and our, our test to see how much we really want to know the Lord more is how much we're in this book and how much we pray. You want to know? You want to know God more? Take a self-evaluation. Am I in the Word of God? Am I praying to God? God wants you to know Him more. And I want you to know this morning that I prayed this for you this week as well as for myself. Every single believer needs this. That God would give you a spirit, an attitude of wisdom and revelation in what? In the knowledge of Him to know God more. Got that point? Clear? God wants you to know Him more. Amen? All right, let's move on. He wants you to know, know Him more. The second thing He wants you to know is that, and that He prayed for is that you would know Simply that God, what is God's calling? What is God's calling for your life? Look at verse number 18 of chapter one. He continues and says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. He prays that you would know God's calling. And specifically before that, he prays that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. What does that mean? What does it mean for the eyes of your heart? You see the heart there, the word heart. Many people will think, oh, that's the emotions. Well, the Greeks didn't use that word like that. They used the word heart there more in, 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 
you know, revel, in, more in regards to the mind and the will of the person. So Paul is praying here that, that the eyes of your will and your heart would be open. That, that you would have an open mind in essence. In, in regards to what, Paul? What do you want us to have an open mind and an open will about? He says, what is the hope of his calling? So, what's the next natural question? <laughs> Paul, what's the hope of his calling? What is the hope of his calling? Simply put, it's that God's great plan for every believer is for us to one day be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So many people look for God's will. Where is it? What do you want me to do, God? You want me to be a missionary? You want me to work at this place? You want me to work at that job? You want me to buy this car? You want me to marry this person? You want me to do this? You want me to go spend time here? You want me to do that? And, and you know what God's number one will for you is as a believer? It's to be made in the image of Jesus Christ. And it starts the moment you put your faith and trust in Him. And as you, as you begin to invest, as you begin to say, okay, I'm going to, in every circumstance, when I eat my bowl of Cheerios to when I go to bed at night and everything that goes on in my day, moment to moment to moment, I know God's purpose for my life is to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. And you know, that's important because what's that do, what that does is give us a sense of purpose. It gives us understanding in who we are in Jesus Christ and that, and that the reason that maybe you're going through that struggle, right? Because we all go through struggle. The reason you're going through that trial, the reason that thing's not happening the way you want it to happen, the reason you haven't found that person, the reason for whatever you're going through could very well be so that you would understand what is the hope of His calling. And what is the hope of His calling? To be made in the image of Jesus Christ. When you understand that as a believer, it revolutionizes your life. It changes the way you live. It changes the way you treat people. Romans 8.29 says it better than anything. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. God's plan for your life, God's purpose for your life, is that you would know the hope of His calling. And the hope of His calling is that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It's this, it's a simple fact that one day you will see Jesus Christ face to face and you will be like Him. Let that sink in for a moment. One day, every single person here is going to stand before Jesus Christ. Believer, one day you will stand before your Savior face to face. Now, if that's not motivation for living the Christian life, I don't know what is. I want to look at my Savior face to face and realize and recognize the love that He has had for me. And I don't want it just to happen when I get to the pearly gates. I want to recognize it and realize it right now. And God wants you to understand how much He loves you. How much He wants you to be conformed to the image of His Son. Not because He's a hard Father that wants you to do something. If you don't do it, He'll spank you. But because He knows how blessed you'll be. Because He knows how much better a life you'll live. Because He, know, because he knows as you become more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ... Not only will he be glorified, but you will be glorified. You know, God wants to bring glory to you as you bring glory to him. That's biblical. God wants to bless you. And I'm not talking about necessary material blessings, all that, that might be the case. I'm talking about what we talked about in verses 1 through 14. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, God wants you to realize right now. Not someday in heaven, not someday in the pearly gates. Right now, God wants us to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. Why is this so vitally important? Do Dr. Kenneth Chafin says, it, says the answer best, and I'm just going to read this verbatim, so listen to this. He says, Dr. Kenneth Chafin, a well-known Baptist author, tells about the pastor and deacon who were visiting pr prospective members and drove up to a beautiful suburban home surrounded by velvet lawn and gorgeous landscaping. Two expensive cars stood in the driveway, and through the, pitch and through the picture window, the men saw their prospect lounging in an easy chair and watching football. The deacon turned to his pastor and said, what kind of good news do we have for him? <laughs> you know, unfortunately, we have this attitude as believers that, that our good news is not as, good, as much of good news as the world's good news. He continues and says, how prone we are to confuse prices and values. Ephesus was a wealthy city. It boasted the Temple of Diana, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Today, Ephesus is an archaeologist's paradise, but... All of its wealth and splendor are gone. But the Christians who once lived there 
are today in heaven, enjoying the glory of God. The hope that belongs to our calling should be a dynamic force in our lives. The fact that we shall one day see Jesus Christ face to face and be made like him should motivate us to live for Christ today. Amen? I, I mean, knowing that one day you'll, you'll see Christ face to face. If that doesn't get your engine running, you need to check your salvation. If the thought of being with Jesus does not give you good feelings and make you happy, I don't care what kind of happiness, maybe it's happiness to shout, maybe it's happiness to cry and weeping and knowing how much He has given to you and that you have a relationship with Him. Listen, if that doesn't stir you up inside, one of two things may be happening. You're away from the Lord or you don't know the Lord. You see, heaven, and I've said this over and over and over again, heaven It's not pearly gates and white fluffy clouds and all those things that we see depicted so erroneously, so falsely. Heaven is Jesus Christ. And it's lit with His radiance. And to know Him is what is the glory of heaven. It's God Himself. And having a relationship with Him for all of eternity. The hope of our calling is to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. You see how this plays out practically in your life? If you know that's your purpose in life, what are you going to do in every situation, in every circumstance? You're going to remember this is happening, and though it might not be from God, I'm going to allow it to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. The things that are hard and bristly and, and, and hurt us, I'm going to allow it to be made, help me made, be made in the image of Jesus Christ. See, the inability to see and understand spiritual things is not the fault of the, or the, of the intelligence, but of the heart. The eyes of the heart must be opened by the Spirit of God. You know, so many times, I think pastors, we look out in the crowd, and there's nobody here doing it today, so don't worry, I'm not picking on anybody. But we see this, or we see this, you know, or, or we see something like that, and, and, and not only is it a discouragement to the pastor, but it's also a, a sign of, I don't really care what God says. Because listen, it's not Dave Pick talking to you this morning. You see, this is the Word of God, and this is God's Word, and it's God speaking to you this morning. So, so when He speaks, we should be listening, we should be attentive, we should be ready, we should be ready to understand what is the hope of His calling, and this is a perfect opportunity for you to understand what is the hope of His calling and be made more into the image of Jesus Christ. Paul prayed that we would know what is the hope of His calling. The third thing Paul prayed for is that, God, that we would know what, is, what are God's riches And that we would know that God's riches are His glory. Look at verse 18, the last part. It says, so that you will know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? See, Paul prayed that you and I would know, and I prayed for you this week, and I prayed for myself this week, that I would know and understand God's riches are His glory. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? Last week we saw that God's gift to us was what? What is God's gift to the believer? Somebody say it. Anybody. God's gift to the believer, don't worry, is His Son. It's Jesus. God's gift to to believers is His Son. And God's gift to His Son is believers. It's it's the church. And and God wants to give Christ the church, and He has given Christ the church, and that's His bride, and and that's His gifts to the church. And so when it says here, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? He's talking about the riches of Christ. He's not talking about necessarily about our riches. He's saying that Jesus Christ has inherited us. He has paid a price, the price being His blood. He has paid that price for you and for me. And, And He has bought it with a high price of His blood. And And that we are His reward, the Bible says. We are His inheritance. This means we are valuable to Him. So many people search for self-esteem in other places and from other people. You know where God, you know that God really understands and God knows that, that your value is based on what He did and that we are valuable to Him. Think about that for a moment. You're valuable to God. You're not just some evolutionary byproduct. You're you're very, very, very valuable to God. His inheritance is God's gift to His Son, the church. You and I are God's riches. You are valuable to Him. We are His inheritance, His reward. And then it says, in the saints. It's talking about believers. The saints are His reward. Why is this so important to you and to me as believers? 
Warren Wearsby says, this is an amazing truth that God should look on us as a part of His great wealth. Just as man's wealth brings glory to His name, so God will get glory from the church because of what He has invested in us. When Jesus Christ returns, we shall be to the praise of the glory of His grace. You remember last week the phrase that kept, we kept hearing over and over again? Anybody remember what it was? To the praise of His glory. To the praise of His glory. To the praise of His glory. You remember that? You see, when you realize who you are in Christ, when you realize that you're His inheritance, when you realize you're His reward, and that word is in there again, His glory, those things exist. We exist. Why? For God's glory. There it is again. Paul is reiterating that we exist. You exist for God's glory. How does that affect your daily life? Not only are you remembering that everything you go through means that you're being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, but it means that you're doing that for God's glory. That it's for Him. I heard a a pastor's wife this last week talk on TV to, to literally tens of thousands of people, I believe. And this person said, this person said, listen, you don't come to church just to praise God and give God glory. And you come to church to, so that God can give you praise and give you glory and so you'll feel better about yourself. When you sing worship songs, you sing them for yourself, not necessarily for God. When you read the Bible and you hear the lesson, you do it for you. And, and you, That's idolatry. That is idolatry and it's false teaching and it should be rejected by the believer. The reason you exist is for God's glory. Stop living for yourself. Live for Him. Be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and live for His praise and for His glory. Amen. Oh man, and, and you know what that does? You, you see, most people think, well, that's, that's dumb. Then I can't have anything that I want. Listen, if you live that way, God will give you more than what you want. Better than what you want. At a better time than when you thought you wanted it. God will bless you so much. Not necessarily maybe with things, but with His inheritance. With every spiritual blessing in the kingdom of God. Living for God's glory, Paul prayed that, that, that we would understand what are God's riches and that we are His riches, we are His inheritance, we are His reward, and that brings value to your life. You are loved by the Almighty. The Almighty. You are loved by the Creator of the universe. Praise God for that. Paul wanted you to know that you are God's riches, you are God's inheritance, and ultimately you are, exist for the praise of His glory. Lastly, Paul prayed that you and I would know God's power within us. Look at verses 19 through 23. Verse 19, he says, And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. He wanted us to understand the power that lies within us. The word power there, we've talked about this in sermons past. The Greek word is the the Greek word dunamis. It means dynamite. (laughs) Anybody ever handled dynamite? Seriously, anybody ever handle dynamite? I, I would be scared just handling that thing, right? And, and what God is saying here to you through Paul is that there is dynamite power in you. It's not as if somebody straps something to you like a dynamite va- vest, like in Tommy Boy. It's as if God shoved that thing down your throat and into your heart and into your soul, and you have power unlike anybody else in this world. Now, how is this relevant to your life? It's relevant because now you know you have the power to live out the Christian life. You have the power to know God better. You have the power to to, to understand that the God's will for your life is to be conformed to the image of Christ. You have the power to live that out. And you have the power to understand that you are an inheritance and you exist for His glory. You have that power in your life. Some other words here that emphasize power is the word working which means energia, which we get our word energy. It's an energizing force, strength. It's the Greek word kratos, and I'm sure I'm saying these wrong. It means dominion. It means power. And then it's the word might, which is the Greek word iskos, which means endowed power. You see, Paul is, is repeating himself on purpose because he wants you to know, he wants me to know that we have power. Not just when we pray for it, how many of you guys have ever, don't raise your hand on this one. How many of you have ever prayed for power? I've prayed for power. You know, that, we don't need to do that. You understand that? Power is already inside of us. Because of who Christ is and because of who we are in Christ, it resides in us. All we have to do is tap into it. Through the power of the Spirit and through faith. 
What Paul is saying here is that you and I have within us as believers in Christ Jesus an unfathomable, dynamite, eternal, energizing power. It's not sinking in, is it? Why is it so hard for us to believe this? Is it because we fail and fail and fail? Everybody struggles with habitual sins. Everybody struggles with sins. Everybody can't kick that habit. Everybody can't get over that one thing. And we wonder why I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to have power. Where is it? And maybe the simple key is a lack of faith. You remember the faith you trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation? He wants you to have that same faith with understanding that that power resides in you and resides in me. See, most of, the fall, most of the time we live a defeatist attitude. We say, I wish I could lose the weight, but I just can't. <laughs> I'll never, ever earn what I need to earn to live the lifestyle I want to live. I just don't have it within me to, to rid myself of this lust. I don't have the strength to quit smoking, to quit gambling, to quit stealing, to quit gossiping, to quit fornicating, to quit lying. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. I don't have the strength to do it. I can't. I don't. I'm a believer, but God, I can't do this. Anybody ever been there? And you see, what he's trying to get us to do is to understand not what we think, but what God says. And God says we have dynamite power already within us. Do you believe that this morning? Verses 20 through 23 continue. He says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he puts all things under subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in and all. You see what that, you know why that is important? Because the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead resides in you, resides in me. Resurrection power is available to you this morning. It tells us that it's the same power that resurrected Christ from the grave. And also it tells us that God fulfilled his perfect will for Jesus Christ. He lifted him up above every nation, every, every, everything. Every, remember Philippians, the, the, the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And if he did it for his son, Jesus Christ, who he allowed to die for who? For you. Won't he too give you the same power? Absolutely he will. Why is this important to know? See, if you don't know, you have the power to change. You don't, if you don't know you have the power to become like Christ, then you won't even try. You'll give up. You'll say it's too hard. If you don't understand that that power was, is within you. You see, we're talking about doctrine this morning. You guys realize this is theology. This is doctrine. This is, this is, it's not super meaty stuff, but it's probably meatier than most of us are used to. And it's important to know these things. How many of you guys remember G.I. Joe? G.I. Joe, great American hero, right? Great cartoon. Some of you guys are like, yeah, my kids watch that, you know. Well, well sometimes they had this, these public service announcements. You guys remember these silly public service announcements? There's like a wire down in the road, and it's like sparking everywhere, and these kids are like in their bikes, and they're like, let's jump it, <laughs> right? And the kid's like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And then one of the G.I. Joes comes out of nowhere. Who knows where they, they just like appear out of thin air. And he's like, hey, kids, that's not a good idea. A down power line is a bad idea to jump over. You know, he goes into to this moralistic type thing and, and they're like, wow, we didn't know that, but now we know. And then it says, and knowing is half the... You know, it's true for you in God's life, in, in, in your life with God. Knowing is half the bottle, battle. We put too little emphasis on doctrine, on theology, because it hurts our ears and we're like, we don't want to do that. Let me just go watch ESPN a little bit more. Let me, let me just, you know, stay away from the doctrine. Give me the practical. But you see, the doctrine impacts the practical. If you don't know who you are in Jesus Christ, you won't be able to live like a Christian should live. Does that make sense? It does, right? And God gives us these things so that we will know who we are in Him so that we can live like He wants us to live so we can be conformed to the image of His Son 
and so that we can bring him glory. It's like this, and I thought about this. I was really proud of myself for thinking about this illustration. It, it, it's, it's like within us lies the power of Superman, but all we believe about ourselves is that we are dorky, fumbling, bumbling Clark Kent, right? Well, gee, Lois, uh, you know. The, the difference is Clark Kent knows he's Superman, but I fear that Christians don't always know and don't always believe that they are children of the risen king. That you have all the power that resurrected Christ from the grave within you. That you exist for His glory. That you are His inheritance. That you are His reward. And, and that you are his, his hope of His calling. That you are, com, you are be to conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. And that He wants to know you more and He wants you to know Him more. Do you understand that when, when you start realizing this, these things and when you start understanding and knowing these things and, and the reason that Paul prayed this for the Ephesian believers and the, ra- the reason that I prayed this for you this week is it because it becomes life-changing. What's the, gr- what's the devil's greatest tactic? It's lies. He feeds you lies about yourself. You, you don't have a relationship with God. You're not really a child of God. Look what you're doing. Look how you act. Look at this. Look at that. And it gets your attention off of God and what, who God has called you to be and who God has declared you to be right now, not when you get to heaven. And he puts it on false things and lies and he trips you up. And we say, oh, you're right. I can't do it. And we live ineffective lives for the kingdom. Are you beginning to realize Obviously, you know this morning, I hope you know, I'm beginning to realize. Uh, God has done a work in my life this week, just amazing. And, and the more I understand and know about him, listen, it's not just a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge. To know that the king of the universe wants to know me like this, has given me these things, that I'm his inheritance, his reward, that he wants me to live for his glory and for his, his praise, and that he has given me the ability to do it. He has put that power within me. Man, it's life-changing. And I want to warn you, because the minute you walk out the door, you'll start to forget. Unless you get back in the love letter. Unless you start to know Him more. You see, the more we know of God, the more we love Him, the more we love Him, the more we want to serve Him. The more we serve Him, the more He fills our hearts with joy. The more joy we have, the more glory He gets. And people come to Christ not because of of a church service, because you're living out who God has called you to be. Once you know, once you know who God is, and once you know that God wants to know you better, and He wants you to know Him better, you'll start to live that way. Once you know what is the hope of His calling, and that you were made in the image of Christ, and He wants you to be conformed to the image of Christ, you will desire to be like him every day. Once you know that God, you are God's inheritance and his rich reward, you will begin to see yourself as valuable. And once you know that you already possess the same dynamite power that raised Christ from the dead, you will begin to utilize that power to live out who, not what, who God has made you to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together to worship your name. Lord, to learn from your word. Father, I pray that today, if there's anybody in here that has never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they're not a follower of Jesus, I pray today they would make the decision, if your Spirit is prompting them, to humble themselves, to admit that they're a sinner, to trust that you are God in the flesh, that Jesus Christ came for them as God in the flesh, that he died on the cross for their sin, that he rose from the grave, conquering death, proving he is God, and that they would place their faith and trust in Him for not only salvation and their eternal destiny, but God, for their lives today, that they would be followers of the Lord Jesus and not just fans. We thank You for what You've done, what You're about to do. I pray that You would continue to speak to us today as we worship You this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.